through. We are recording this session because there are some people who were unable to make it at this time and we want to enable everyone to um, benefit from the wisdom that will be shared with us today. Um, so hi, I'm Lindsay Goldman. I am the CEO of Grantmakers in Aging. Thank you so much for being with us today. I'm going to tell you just a little bit about our organization and what we're doing here, and then I'm going to turn it over to our uh, reframer in chief, Alri McNiff Daniels. So at Grantmakers in Aging, we are working towards a just and inclusive world where all people are fully valued, recognized, and engaged at all ages. Next slide. And our mission is to mobilize the social, intellectual, and financial capital required to improve the aging experience now and in the future. We offer a community of practice for funders to learn, connect, and collaborate. And we help funders to identify mission-aligned investment opportunities. Next slide. The most exciting and enlightening event of our year is our annual conference, which we have waited two years to finally have again in person. Um, Please, if you have not registered yet, you want to do that today because our early bird rate ends tomorrow. And as an added selling point, these are actual birds that I saw outside my hotel room at the conference venue when I was there just a month ago. There are lovebirds that live in the trees and they are so beautiful, you will not wanna miss them. So please be an early bird and register for the conference. Next slide. And I believe Alice put in the chat the link. So at GIA, we see diversity, equity, and inclusion as core operational and philanthropic values. So at our events, we want to ensure that the way we talk about aging, as well as other aspects of people's identities, is respectful, asset-based, and aligned with those values. Reframing Aging is an initiative to counter pervasive ageism through the intentional use of narrative and language. GIA is proud to have been involved in the collaborative that founded and launched Reframing Aging, I believe around 2014. And we, re we remain very actively engaged with our colleagues at GSA who are currently leading the effort and in ongoing dialogue about how we can apply Reframing Aging principles to all of our communications along with a lot of other national aging organizations. So to lead us in our discussion today, we've called in an expert. Alri McNiff Daniels is an experienced reframing aging trainer, and she serves as the Director of Communications and Stakeholder Engagement at Point32 Health. Alri, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay, for having me. Thank you all for giving us some time this afternoon. Um, I am going to take a minute to share my screen um, and get my slides up. And I just have to think and make sure, yes, I checked the select sound. And this is the right screen. This, yeah, this is the right screen. And I'll put this into place. And then we will go to share and we will start. Okay, awesome. Slides worked. That's always the most nerve wracking part of this for me because technology can do anything. Um, as Lindsay said, we have quite a lot on the agenda. Um, I invite you all to participate as much as you can. Um, we're going to use the chat feature heavily today and I wanna thank Alice in advance for helping me monitor the chat. It's on my other screen. So she will be calling out and letting me know what's coming in. Um, as I talk a little bit about what we're going to do, I'd really like to know who's on the call. Um, I did scan the Zoom labels, but I'm also interested to know if folks have um, had any experience with reframing aging, either reading the materials 
composite frameworks published or attending a presentation. So folks could just chat in for me their name um, and, and yes or no about whether they've had some exposure to reframing aging. Um, that would be terrific. I'm also getting a little bit of background noise. So if folks could uh, remember to put themselves on mute, that would be really helpful. Um, thank you for that. Thank you very much. Um, so um, here's how we're thinking about today. Um, this is, you know, an opportunity for us to learn from each other, and I include myself in that. I am, Lindsay very kindly referred to me as an expert. Um, I, I'm not an expert. Um, I am grateful to the Frameworks Association, um, Frameworks Initiative, who have shared their learnings with us. Um, I don't work for Frameworks, but um, I have had the opportunity to do this work for several years. I really am still learning, um, but I'm delighted to be able to share what I learned from them and continue to learn. Um, I hope you'll ask questions. I'm okay with being interrupted. If you have a question that's really specific, you know, I don't understand this slide, or can you um, help? Can you go back and give me a little bit more detail? Absolutely happy to do that. If you've got a bigger, more philosophical question and you want to drop it in the chat, we will probably save it for the Q&A at the end. Um, hopefully we can have a little bit of a conversation. I've tried to reserve about 20 minutes for Q&A. Um, there are some, there's a couple of polls, there's a couple of word association opportunities. So, you know, please participate. Um, the other thing that I will call out is this concept of no shame. Um, I think everybody that I trained with had a very similar experience of um, cringing a little bit as we heard what frameworks had learned in their research and the recommendations that they were sharing. Um, and I think that's kind of learning, right? Um, we, we make mistakes and we grow and we learn. Um, so I continue to try to um, give myself grace um, and ask you all to give yourselves grace as we go through this, um, because that's, that's a good way to learn. And thank you who have, for folks, I see that we have a couple of folks who have said that they are familiar with reframing and several who have not been to reframing before. So um, that's really good to know. Um, what I will tell you is um, because I know that you all have presentations that you have probably given before and are experts in your field, um, this, this particular presentation is is tailored to that. It does not include some of the more detailed narrative change um, stories that frameworks would give as examples, um, because I thought that it would uh, be a better use of your time to think about some of the specific language um, and some of the reasons that when experts speak, um, it is really helpful to follow the recommendations. So moving on, um, just a quick overview of what the agenda is going to look like. Um, I will share the slides um, with Alice so she can share them all with you at the end of the presentation. We will be looking at a very brief video. Um, that's some research that Frameworks did. I will not be able to share that with you. It's covered by the Institutional Research Board because it's material that was gathered um, with um, human research subjects. So you, you'll be able to see it today, but I'll just let you know it's not going to be in the slides that you receive later. Um, so. I'm going to dig in. Um, you know, what at the root of the conversation here, and you heard Lindsay talk about it, is we, we live in a world full of ageism. And um, it's really important to start with a definition. You know, it, it's prejudice and discrimination and stereotypes. It's internalized. It, we're surrounded by it in culture. Um, and one of the things that makes it um, really frustrating for those of us who work um, in the aging community is it's considered less ser serious than other forms of discrimination. Um, but when you think about the cumulative effects of discrimination, you really understand how it um, combines with others to, to make for some challenges. And it's really something we need to understand. We see examples of misperceptions about older people and age everywhere. Um, you know, we're barraged with media, uh, we, we hear jokes, funny stories, people, you know, say you're over the hill when you turn 40, you go to the drugstore and you see aisles and aisles of creams and potions that say anti-aging as though we all don't want to age without considering what the alternative is. We see black bordered birthday cards. I mean, it, it's just Everything about the messages that we receive in the US culture is aging is bad. Um, it seeps into our healthcare system 
and we see it in workplace and we see policies that um, work against it. So this is sort of the um, ecosystem that we're working in when we talk about aging. It happens on a lot of different levels. Um, it happens in our interpersonal interactions. Um, I, I, the examples I include here tend to be a healthcare, um, some of them are my own lived experience, taking older people to the doctor and having the provider look at me or ask the questions of me instead of looking at the patient and making eye contact. Um, when we say somebody is too set in their ways, um, kind of a code for they're not a lifelong learner, they can't learn. We see institutional ageism when we see mandatory retirement policies or we see clinical trials that don't accept people over a certain age. We have our own internalized and individual ageism where we um, don't give ourselves credit or the opportunity to learn something new, or we dismiss a health concern because we attribute it to normal aging and we don't ask our provider. Um, it's, that's actually a very common concern um, that we're seeing from our healthcare colleagues. Um, and this last point, this last I, I think is a really important piece to think about, and we'll talk a little more. It's implicit, um, it is subconscious, it's, it's baked into our, the way back part of our brain, um, and we don't know it's there. And so it kind of creeps up on us sometimes, and that's why I think it's a little bit um, more challenging to keep track of. So Alice has a poll for us um, that includes some examples of the kinds of everyday ageism that people experience. And I'm going to let her put it up. Um, and if you could just check all of the um, experiences that you agree with. Um, and we'll give this about a minute. I will tell you this is, um, this poll was actually conducted by the University of Michigan. The results were released in 2020. Um, and they asked a cohort of uh, several hundred people these questions. Um, and I thought that the answers were really illuminating. Um, and look at this, I'm already seeing, oh, we've, we've got one person has come and we've got 17 participants. So we're going to try to keep it up long enough to get some good responses, uh, a, a good percentage of the group here. Um, thank you, we're up to five. Excellent, good, we'll keep going. Almost halfway there. Oh, now we're, now we're rolling, we've got 11. 12, excellent. Okay, 13, excellent. Okay, we've got 76%. I'm gonna give it 10 more seconds and then we'll go on. So, so far, um, We've got 85% of people in this poll are saying that they see, hear, or read jokes about old age. 77% see, hear, or read things suggesting older people, oops, my screen cuts off here, are unattractive or undesirable, um, feeling lonely, feeling sad. People assume I have difficulty with computers or cell phones. So you can see, um, you know, quite, quite, Quite a strong uh, number of people are, are having these kinds of experiences. So I'm going to stop sharing the poll, share the results. Here we go. I'm going to do, I'll do it this way, Alice. I'm not used to having the co-host. Here we go. There we go. Um, so these are the actual results from the Michigan survey, which you can see are very similar to what you all are seeing and experiencing. Um, and, and I like to share this poll because I think it helps us understand um, how insidious ageism is and how it sort of sneaks into every little piece of our daily life. It's um, these assumptions and misperceptions and, and they really have an impact on people. And so the other piece that comes out of the poll is that of the people who reported experiencing ageism in their day-to-day -day lives, 82%, so that was 82%. Um, and they also reported a connection to physical and mental health. So there's a link between um, ageism and worse physical and mental health. Um, and 36% of the people reported feeling this internalized ageism that I referenced, which can also have an impact on our health. So, you know, this gives us a sense of why we're having these conversations. Um, and I think it's worth pointing out, this is while the frameworks research and recommendations are going to be based on 
experiments and research done in the United States. Ageism is not exclusive to North, United States or even North America. Um, the World Health Organization has labeled it a global concern. They point out that um, we tend to have this idea of older people as a um, monolithic, very homogeneous group, which is not accurate. There's no typical older person. Um, they point out in their report on ageism that expenditures on older people are an investment. That is not language that we typically hear. We typically hear about the costs associated with programs for older people, and we reserve the word investment for programs for younger people. And the World Health Organization says something that I'm sure everyone on this call knows, um, but I think it's worth um, repeating that aging and our experience of aging is not predetermined, it's not genetic, it's very much influenced by the world around us. So um, we see aging show up in a lot of different ways. Um, Dr. Becca Levy at the Yale School of Public Health found the harmful effects of ages, ageism in 45 countries. Um, and it's, um, we talked earlier about the idea that people don't seek health for issues they consider normal aging. Another thing that happens in healthcare particularly is that people make assumptions. Um, they assume that an older, people, uh, an older person um, maybe doesn't need to be tested for sexually transmitted diseases, or they screen differently for substance use or alcohol use um, because they make assumptions about behaviors of older people. So there are some costs associated with ageism as a result of these institutional and interpersonal ageism approaches that we see. Um, and Dr. Levy and her team have calculated it at $36 billion annually. Um, so all of that is to you know, get us toward this conversation about why, why are we talking to you about ageism and why are we talking to you about reframing? And the answer is because these misperceptions that are so prevalent affect all of us. They, they affect people individually when um, folks are asked to retire because they've hit a certain number or folks are not invited to participate in community boards or events because they're older, but they also affect our communities um, because we live in a world that has decided that older people are not an investment, so we don't get the support for the policies that are important to have the social supports in place in our communities that would help older people and likely younger people as well. Um, we see workforce discrimination. We see all kinds of ripple effects as a result of these misperceptions. I'm sure these are not new statistics for you all, um, but the fact of the matter is we, we are facing changing demographics, not only in terms of age, but in terms of diversity in our country. Um, and those of us who work in this world know that these changing demographics are gonna require that we think differently about the systems that we've put in place. Um, and to be able to be effective as advocates for these kinds of policy and systems change, we need to be a little bit smarter about the way we talk to lawmakers and the way we talk as experts to the community. Um, this slide will probably be a, a layup for this group, but it's, it's kind of fun for me. Um, when we talk about systems and practices, um, I, I love to ask the group if, um, and yes, you will get the slides. Um, I love to ask the group if anyone wants to chat in the reason that 1935 is an important date on this slide. All right, I will go. I will go ahead and tell you. Um, it is the year Social Security was put into place, and the reason that I have it on the slide is, you know, you can see what the um, life expectancy was in 1935, and we know that Social Security at that time was designed to start paying out at, nine, at, at the age of 62. Of course, it's it's um, stepped up in the years since um, for for some people, depending on when you were born, but. I mean, simple math, like if you look at a system like Social Security that was built in 1935 when the life expectancy was here, 
and then you look at the current life expectancy, it's just one really clear example. We see we have medical advances, we have these opportunities that allow us to lead um, fuller, longer, and hopefully healthier lives. Um, so we really have to think about what we can do in terms of bringing folks along to change practices um, so that, that we can support aging in a healthy way. But here's the reality. Um, and the frameworks folks label this slide, experts say, people think. It's sort of a A, B. Um, and it's not important what the details of what people are saying. What's really important is that when people talk about aging, the messages are not getting through. Um, they're not getting through, they're not absorbing the data, they're not absorbing the need to make changes. Um, they, they just don't believe, they don't accept, they're, they're not willing to have these conversations. Um, and it's, it's really been an ongoing challenge, which is what led us to having these conversations about reframing aging. So we have a role um, in understanding these implicit biases that we all hold and, and how they block people from thinking productively and being open to new ideas and being willing to change things to consider solutions. Um, framing can, um, and this is a, a framework's expression, activate productive mindsets. Um, and I really like that concept that the words that we use can either cue people up to be thinking forward and open or the words we can use can um, create a, a blockade, a, you know, a, a close the doors. You know, you say a certain word and people just, oh, I'm done. I can't hear you anymore. We've all had that experience our, in our own lives, um, but we don't necessarily know what those words would be that create the walls that stop the conversation. The great part about this research that Frameworks has done is they're going to tell us the words. Um, and and that, that is um, really, really helpful. So we know what to avoid and we know how to cue up the pro productive mindsets and um, avoid falling into the trap where we are trying to present data or information or tell a story and we've lost our audience for just the choice of a simple word. So Lindsay and I talked about this a little bit before um, the presentation. Um, there's a reason that I'm asking this question, which I will um, share in a moment, um, but I'm gonna go ahead and let Alice put up the next poll. Um, just really simple, quick answer. I'm not looking for people to you know, give me a um, scientific response or a statistical answer. Um, terrific. Okay, we've got four, we've got four quick fingers. Oh, good, eight, nice, this is good. Excellent, nice. Couple more people maybe? We're at 13, 14, good. All right, all right. So this group says that oh, 43 and 43, so it's evenly divided between 80 and 90 with three people who think 70 is old. That's great, thank you, Beck. thank you, thank you for that. So, oh, so many, so many buttons to press. Um, so, Here's what I find fascinating. I'm sure you've all, all heard people say, old age is 10 years older than I am, or old age is 20 years older than I am, and people kind of say it, and there's a little bit of laughter. So there was an article in 2018 in Frontiers in Psychology, um, and it was about aging, and it was about how people think about aging. Um, and the article talks about the stigma associated with aging, and this idea that as we age, we begin to see ourselves approaching this, this group that we've held negative attitudes toward our entire lives. And we are so dismayed to be a part of this club that we don't want anything to do with, that we psychologically disassociate ourselves from this idea of older adults. Um, and I have a note here, and I'm actually going to read it because I just, the, the, the journal article does not use the word othering, but it is just such a classic example of this idea of othering, where we, um, a phenomenon where groups are defined and labeled as not fitting in within the norms 
It's an effect that influences how people perceive and treat those who are viewed as being part of the out group versus being part of the in group. So we've been conditioned to other. You know, we have researchers who have shown us that people consistently push away old age, disassociate themselves. It's why we don't tell the doctor about something that might be concerned because if we think it's associated with aging, we don't wanna be associated with older and aging. So it really, really sinks into our minds. So, and it all comes down for in many cases to this idea of implicit bias, that it's operating on the subconscious level. Um, so we've, many of, the, many of you on the phone are folks who are experts in aging and you've done research or you, you are working with aging populations and you are very keenly aware of what is so important for older adults. I know from having done this for several years now that none of us are immune from implicit bias. Um, and so one of the resources that I have included at the end of this uh, PowerPoint is a link to an online implicit bias test, the implicit association tests, um, they're called. There, there's more than a dozen of them. Um, you can see if you have an implicit bias toward aging, toward um, different, different groups of people from social and ethnic backgrounds, um, police officers, people in the military, so, you know, there's a variety of tests. Um, I will tell you the first time I took an implicit bias test, I went in um, with some hubris. I thought that I had been doing the work long enough that I didn't have it. Um, I was brought back down to earth very quickly. Um, and so I took a few more tests and my bubble was popped even more. Um, what I think is really important to know that the effort of taking the test, having the conversation about implicit bias, will raise your awareness and will help you on that journey. Um, it has certainly helped me. It, it is hard work. Um, we, are, we have really, really been steeped in this idea of bias against older people. So um, we know that there's an uphill road. So um, I encourage you to look at the resource when you get the deck um, and consider taking the test and, and, and challenging yourself in that way. So, Frameworks and framing. Lindsay mentioned earlier um, that GIA has supported this initiative, which um, was a multi-year effort uh, sponsored by the lead leaders of aging organizations. And they are on this slide and we're all very grateful for their forward thinking approach to this work. Um, the work was funded by organizations all across the country. Um, I would not be surprised that many of the folks on this call have worked with or know some of these organizations. Um, and the folks uh, Frameworks is a nonprofit social change organization based in DC. Um, this slide includes the kinds of different research techniques and methodologies that they used to conduct the research. Um, they, they, talked to or worked with more than 12,000 people across the country. Um, as I said earlier, I am not employed by frameworks. So if you have specific questions about any of the methodology, I'd be happy to try to get an answer for you, but I am not likely to be able to give you that specific answer. Um, but I think what's really important here is that this is not PR spin. This is not, um, I prefer to say, choice and you prefer to say selection. Um, these are um, evidence-based recommendations to change the way people think about a topic. And Frameworks has done this on a number of topics. So when Frameworks talks about framing, um, they, it's a, they talk about it and it's for, for, for the frameworks team, you know, they know that there, this is a science. There's certainly an art element to it, but it's a science that has emerged over the past 50 plus years. It, it draws on linguistics and political science and sociology and psychology. Um, they know that the way we present information affects attitudes and understandings and actions. Um, so what they tell us is that as we're thinking about presenting information, that to, to take some time and be deliberate with the choices, what to emphasize, what needs to be explained, maybe what's left unsaid, 
because you have an opportunity to cue a specific response if you make those intentional choices in framing. It's a set of choices that you make. I duplicated my slide, I'm gonna move along. Um, so I, I like to use this example and I also like to point out that this work was done in 2004. Um, I think given the world that we've been in for the past few years, it might be easy to assume that um, this is current research, but it's not. Um, so this is an experiment that was done not by frameworks. Um, it was done by researchers. I believe they were at Stanford University in California, um, and they were studying framing. And so they asked, asked people two questions. Um, given the importance of free speech, would you favor allowing a hate group to hold a political rally? And when framed that way, making the choice to emphasize free speech, 85% of the people polled said yes, they would favor allowing a hate group to hold a political rally. The other question was, given the risk of violence, would you favor allowing a hate group to hold a political rally? So you can see the questions are very similar. The choice was made to emphasize the value of free speech here, and here the choice was made to, to emphasize the risk of violence. And you can see there's a really dramatic difference in the results in terms of how people feel and how people respond to that framing. So this is seminal, a seminal example in the world of framing. Um, and I think it, it, it's a very dramatic way of looking at um, what information you want to give the audience if you want to help them think or what you're offering. Now, Frameworks has, like most nonprofit organizations, um, a theory of change, and um, they, they present it in this way, that frames can drive broad social change. Um, what I think is really important here is that as experts, as role models, as presenters at the GIA conference, your framing choices um, will help change the thoughts and actions of the, of the folks in the audience. Um, that you, the words that you choose, the, the way that you set up the conversation will be received in a certain way and will influence the discourse of people who leave the room. And this is important, Frameworks tells us, because when the experts start using certain kinds of words and start um, emphasizing certain frames, it starts to influence what's happening in newspaper articles, magazine, TV, all kinds of discourse. It will happen, change what will happen to people going back from the conference and sharing with their colleagues and their home organizations. And those subtle, sometimes word changes, start to influence how people think about something, which opens the door for the policy changes that are necessary. Um, an example of this, and this is not work that Frameworks Institute did, but an example of this journey can be seen in the evolution of the work for um, what was at the time called gay marriage about 20 years ago, when folks were e emphasizing the idea of rights and benefits. You heard a lot about the idea that um, folks from the LGBTQ plus community wanted to marry because people wanted the same rights and benefits. And that worked for a time. And then the folks, the organizers hit a wall in California, proposition was not passed, and folks regrouped. And instead, they re, re refined their message and said, we need to understand what unites us, not what divides us. And when people think about marriage, they think about not rights and benefits, they think about commitment and love. So the organizers of that campaign regrouped and they focused on love and commitment and the conversation turned to marriage equality. And there have been case studies written on this, and there's you know, all kinds of um, really interesting reading, if, if you're inclined, to see that this change in communications really helps shift thinking and cue productive mindsets to make it easier for the change that needed to be made. So that's, that's why we're having the conversation about the framework's work, and that's why you all are so important to the conversation because you're influencers and your words will carry weight. 
Okay, we've got some audience participation coming up here. So um, Frameworks talks about something called cultural models. Um, and sometimes I think that um, it's easier to see or experience than to tell. So we are just going to um, get some chatting going. Um, I'm going to hit my return button in a moment. You're going to see a photo. And I'm going to ask you to very quickly chat in what you think you see in the photo. It is, um, so I don't want you to tell me that you see a big white box on the right side of the screen. There's always one person who thinks that's a fun thing to do. Um, I'm focusing on the left side of the screen. Um, what do you see? What do you think it is? Don't think, just give me really quick reactions, please. And I'm gonna let Alice monitor the chat, the chat please. Okay, so we have trees, tire tracks in the sand, sand with tire tracks, sand, uh, tractor tracks, tire tracks in the sand, tracks in the sand, tire tracks in the sand. So we have some consensus here. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> That's awesome. All right. So they are tracks in sand. I, I heard tire a lot. Um, I see tractor too. Oh. Mm -hmm. oh. No, it's so. Oh, we've got somebody who isn't muted. If you could mute, please, that would be great. So this is a picture of turtle tracks. Sea turtles um, live in the ocean, but when it comes time to lay their eggs, they crawl up on the sand, they dig a big hole, they lay their eggs, they cover it up, it becomes a big mound, they go back in the water. Um, and the reason that I share this slide is that most people haven't seen sea turtle tracks. Many people have seen tractor trail, tractor tracks or cars driving on sand or something else that this photo evokes for them. And that is an, oops, let's try this again. There we go. Um, and that is an example of how cultural models work. Our brains are designed to process information very efficiently. So we rely on cultural models to take all these inputs. What are we reading? What are we he hearing? What are we seeing? What's somebody telling us? We've got all this data coming at us and our brains have to sort it and analyze it very quickly. So what our brains default to is a mechanism by where new information comes in and connects to something that's already in our brains. So the ecosystem that we live in, the environment that we live in influences what, what comes in. In this case, folks who are not familiar with turtle tracks would never think to consider that that might be a photo of turtle tracks because it's not something that's existing in your mindset. You don't have that cultural model. Um, so that's really important to understand why we struggle. And you know, I'm gonna refer back to that slide of the you know, experts are saying one thing about aging and people are hearing something else because people are just, they don't have anything to connect it to that's positive or good. They, they go back to, the aisles and Walgreens and CVS that are full of anti-aging creams and they hear anything associated with aging and that's the cultural model that they reference. Now, it's not necessarily that um, we're, we're saying that words are necessarily good or necessarily bad. Um, it's that words have associations with them, even the simplest words. Um, so the next, I'm going to put up another slide and I'm going to ask people to, again, very quickly, tell me what you associate when you see this word. And Alice is going to keep track as they come in. Hermit. <laughs> it's not easy being green. Uh, environment, color, eco-friendly, flower stems, go, plants, money. Grass, environment, spring. So quite a variety, quite a variety. Um, I've heard people um, say rookie or newbie, um, somebody with less experience. Um, but you can see the idea is you know, you think green means go, somebody else thinks green means money or the environment. Very simple word, no 
good or bad association with it. It just evokes something very specific in the person that you might be talking to. One more word. Wings. And Alice is watching the chat. So we have fly, birds, fly, spicy, <laughs> our food. Oh, I've got two Freedom. favorites. Two favorites, and they're not up there yet. Feathers. Soaring, birds. We don't have any angels in this group. I almost always get angels. And there's one other that I I got in one or two, but not usually. But the fact that it came in the same um, chat as angels made me laugh. The Harley Davidson logo is wings, which I can't tell you that I would have known except for this person saying it. It came in right after angels. So again, you know, really simple words. Um, and you don't know what, you know, you think you're referring to wings and you're trying to evoke, you know, heavenly bodies or beautiful birds or, or butterflies or something like that. And, you know, the audience that you're talking to is thinking Harley Davidson probably a little bit different from where you think they're going. So um, that's how cultural models work. Just, you know, it, it, in, the, in the simplified version. So frameworks set out using various research methodologies to understand um, over a period of uh, two plus almost three years, how the public thinks about aging so that they could form some hypotheses and test some examples of language that would be better for us to use when we're talking about aging. Um, they wanted to know what the cultural models were. You know, what do people think? You know, is it Harley Davidson or angels? Is it Kermit or is it money? What's in people's heads when we talk about aging? So I am going to share a brief video. Um, it's um, person on the street interviews that were conducted across the United States. They're just very quick samples. Um, they're, they're, it's part of the, the research, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and I'd like you to listen um, because we get to there. There we go. There we go. So um, you got many of you called these out in the chat, this idea. The themes that you know we've identified here are this inevitability of decline, um, the frail, sick, need nursing care. A lot of reflection, you know, in the good old days, it was this way. Um, unable to use technology, not interested in learning new things. So it's really important to understand that these are the models that people have. This is the mindset that folks are thinking about when um, I'm sorry, I've, well, let's see, I'll just do it this way. There we go. Um, my, my presentation mode, I lost a piece of it. I don't know where it went. Let me try. There we go. Okay, this will help me keep track. I apologize. Um, so so here's, here's what Frameworks tells us. You know, you heard the themes in the interviews. They distilled the themes from these interviews and many other research, um, research formats. And they tell us that the public opinion is very, very strong about aging. And that what we need to know when we're talking to people about aging is, as we've discussed a little bit already today, there is this incredible desire to other, to divide, to counter to create this us versus them, zero sum narrative. Um, so that is there and it's very strong. So we have to be aware of that and think about how to counter that in our words. Some of the other things that they identified is that um, folks think of nostalgia and they see modern things and modernity as a threat. That shows up in, in language like, in the good old days, everybody could count on a pension. Or in the good old days, families weren't so widely dispersed and grandchildren were nearby and grandparents could live with extended families. Now, of course, this 
in the good old days construct falls apart pretty quickly when you realize that in the good old days, not everybody had a pension, not everybody had equal opportunities, redlining prevented whole swaths of the population from owning homes, other systemic racism prevented folks from banking or doing all kinds of things that were important, getting jobs, getting a quality education. So it's misplaced at best to say in the good old days is um, a consistent, um, that the old days were consistently good. That's what I meant to say there. Um, there's a very strong theme of individualism. You should have done this exercise, eat right, not smoked, saved more money. It's the person, it's an individual family's responsibility. Um, the other thing that's very interesting that Frameworks has unearthed for us is that the problem feels so big that people feel overwhelmed and get very fatalistic. I know there's a problem, whether it's social security or something else related to aging, but I can only worry about so much and it's too overwhelming and I just can't, there's no solutions. I just cannot think about it. I cannot hear more statistics. Um, and then the final thing, which we definitely saw some of this in the video, um, and I'm personally fascinated by this, is that we have two very different ideas of aging that we hold in our heads at exactly the same time. So on the one hand, we perceive aging as a period of decline and deficits and illness and um, dependency. And simultaneously, we hold this idea of retirement and golf vacations and cruises and grandchildren and all these positive things. And so both concepts are there, but they're equally weighted. And so folks really don't know what to do with them. So when we're talking about aging, this is what people think. Regardless of what we're telling them, this is, this is what is in their brains. And this is what we're trying to, um, trying to work with. Now, the good news is that Frameworks does tell us that there's something we can do. Um, that if we take the time to understand that this is what we're facing, that we can reframe our messages, that we can use what they've learned um, to invite rethinking, to invite folks into the conversation, and to be more positive, and even just to be able to hear us and to be able to think with us and, and be partners with us. So Frameworks has identified three general principles, I guess I will call them. Um, they refer to them as orchids, um, that we, you know, these positive things that can flourish in this swampy environment that they've discovered around aging. Um, but you know, this, this, these general concepts that as a community, as a nation, um, there is across this group of people that were interviewed and generally speaking across the country, there is a sense of problems can be solved. Um, so using language or telling stories that show solutions and suggest that if we come together, we can work to come to address this challenge, um, that is a very positive thing that we can do. Um, collective responsibility is also in our cultural mindsets. Um, I live in New England. And so, you know, I, I often, um, when I'm talking to groups, I often take advantage of the fact that I can cue up the idea of Boston had the first public transit system. We won't talk about where it is today. I'm sure you've all seen the headlines, <laughs> but you know it, it's something that can queue up. Or um, there's a couple of different New England states that claim to have had the first library. Um, last night, yeah, last night somebody told me that Maine claims to have created the whoopie pie. So you know there's something in your community that you know you can probably refer to as you know a group of people came together. They they work together on something and this was a solution. So, so that is something that can be a really effective way to cue up this idea of we're talking about a big problem. We're talking about how to think about housing or, or supports for people who are living in community or whatever it is that you want to share. 
but let's look at some of the bigger challenges that we've already tackled and let's see the examples of how we've come together and solved them. And the other idea that um, you didn't hear in the video and doesn't come through in most conversations about aging, but is present, it might be a little bit further back in my folks' minds, but is present, this idea that what shapes us surrounds us. The idea that so there, a growing understanding and Frameworks has actually done some recent research on this, that there's a growing understanding of how systems influence where we are. Um, that housing and transportation and access to healthy food and the neighborhoods that, neighborhoods that we live in, all of these things, access to education, all of these things influence how we age, not only 50 plus or 60 plus, but how we age throughout our lives. So we, if we know that we're communicating into this, um, the, the series of challenges where people want to divide into two camps, people want to separate themselves from the idea of being old and being near older people, people are overwhelmed and they feel fatalistic, um, they, they associate decline and deterioration. If, if we know all of the, those things are out there, if we know that most of the people in most of the audiences that we're communicating with have those models in their mind, the beginning of the solution is thinking about how to elevate these concepts to cue their thinking, to prime them to be more open to hearing the data, the solution, the way that you would like folks to come together to think differently about what we're tackling. So this is, so throughout, throughout the presentation, you'll see that there's um, photos and, and, and ads and some other things. I've tried to credit um, the organizations that have done them. Um, so this is one of my favorite buttons. It's from our friends in Age Friendly Ohio. Aging, it's so cool, everyone is doing it. You know, that cues a productive mindset. Um, the language on the right is language that Frameworks has tested and has tested very well with folks that when we work to create vibrant, thriving communities, it helps everyone maximize their potential and fully, con fully contribute. And this requires collaboration. So, you know, there's, there's different ways to think about the language that you want to use, but the, at the heart of it, what's really important here is um, to think about, you can still share the statistics. You know, we're not asking anybody to say, oh, don't, don't, don't give data. You know, data is good. Data is important. Data is going to help us move forward. But to, to think about framing it to say, you know, yeah, we've got some challenges, but let's, let's find a way to work together. Let's look at, let's dig into this and see how this can be helpful. So, um, oh, this is one of, I, I mentioned that you'll see throughout the uh, presentation, you'll see some different, um, ads. This is from the city of Toronto. It was a bus shelter campaign. And this was the first, for, this was up for several weeks and then they replaced it with another ad. But as you can see, this was an ad for aging cream and aging cream doesn't exist, but the value of older employees does. And then several weeks later, a different um, poster went up and said, you know, you, you want to erase aging, you know, pointing out the value and the importance of valuing and accepting and including folks of all ages. So we've, oops, sorry. We've talked a little bit about this. We have referred to it briefly, but I, I wanna take a minute to just call this out because I think it's really important. And I think the time that we live in really um, makes it even more important for us to be explicit. Um, when we are talking about um, disparities, um, health disparities, it's really important to understand the inequities that lead to health disparities um, and that there are opportunities to address various social determinants of health and that the social determinants of health have a very strong role in determining health. I think we um, kind of forget we use SDH, we use the shorthand or we, we, we become accustomed, but these influence the health of people in communities across the country. Um, so instead of 
speaking generally and broadly to be able to say, you know, a community that has consistently been under-resourced has um, more consistently, going, is more consistently going to experience health disparities like X and Y because education, transportation, lack of access to health care, lack of access to fresh, affordable food, all of those things. So it's really important to put um, into context as people age, what is influencing um, the way they age, the way we age. I saw this recently, the second bullet, um, and I think it just puts it in a really concise frame that I um, have struggled to express before. The idea that race and ethnicity is a social construct, it's not biology. Um, and so I'll give an example. When you hear somebody say, um, and this is, this is why context is important. When you hear somebody say that um, X community, you know, um, the, uh, a community of black people has higher rates of obesity and asthma, that allows the, the person hearing that data point to make some assumptions. Maybe that person will assume that black people are predisposed to obesity and asthma. It is more likely that, the, that black people in that study had exposures to air pollution because the community that they lived in was near a highway or possibly were living in apartments that had exposure to lead paint or possibly didn't have um, opportunities for exercise because there weren't community playgrounds that were well lit or available. All of these other factors play in. So I think that our the folks at Frameworks have really helped me understand that if we just make a statement, it leaves room for people to fill in their own story and people make assumptions. And so if there is information about a specific group and we want to help people get past their assumptions and we have to provide the data and we have to provide the explanation. Um, and you know, all of that leads to this idea that um, accumulated experiences, inequities, all of these are present um, and everyone's experience of aging is going to be different. And we have an opportunity to influence um, how people think about it and how people uh, assign resources to be helpful in the communities where it's most needed. The concept of intersectionality has you know, been in the background of this conversation. I just like to call this out. I do not think this is a comprehensive example, um, but oftentimes we forget how many pieces play into a person's lived experience of aging. Um, Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw, coined this word intersectionality and that we're seeing more and more now. And I do think it's really helpful to just kind of stop and think whatever community you're working with, um, all of the factors and think about how they play in and how your work could be perceived differently or benefit differently or, or um, be heard differently from folks in different. Um, oftentimes these conversations um, about equity can exclude ageism. Um, we, of course, want folks to think about ageism when we're, they're thinking about all of these other factors. And I think it's a two-way street that we also think about other factors and be good allies to the extent that we can in our work. So I am going to switch gears a little bit here um, and talk a little bit about some other kinds of language. Um, and I just want to be clear that what I have been presenting, you know, from the video and, and, and what I've been talking about is based on frameworks research. And the next couple of slides that I'm going to share um, are adjacent to frameworks research, um, but it's not drawn directly from frameworks. Um, it's been part of my learning journey and that of my colleagues to understand the role that language plays and, and how it, it changes. And I don't think we always think about it that way. Um, you know, we, we look at Merriam-Webster added almost 400 words and phrases to the dictionary last year. Um, words that once meant something to, in my grandmother's generation, need, mean something completely different now. Um, and one of the most adorable things is listening to my mother-in-law try to talk to my son about tweeting, no, twittering. She, talk, she, she calls it twittering in a new word, 
she's trying, she's awesome. Um, and she uses her iPad better than my daughter uses her iPad, but she just can't get past Twittering and we all kind of chuckle. So language is evolving, it's the real world. Um, and we may be in an environment where we're following a medical model that uses certain kinds of words, or we're using an academic model that you know relies on census data that pulls very specific kinds of words. Um, and as a result, we may be using words that no longer really fit the communities that we're working with. Um, so I just put a couple of slides together, pulled from some resources like the Associated Press, APA, AMA style guides. The American Heart Association has a really excellent style guide on inclusive language. Um, so I offer a couple of slides here to just talk about um, some other ways that we can be allies for inclusive language that is um, more respectful and may be a better reflection of the communities that we're, we're serving. So this first slide here is about this idea of person-centric language. Um, for many people, the default is to use the descriptor in, in, in front of the person. Um, and this flips it around. Somebody uses a wheelchair or is living with dementia or with a mental illness. People are experiencing homelessness rather than calling them homeless people. Um, the one thing that I would add here um, is generally speaking, if there's a temptation to use the, the as in the homeless or the XYZ group, that is probably um, a, a good little flag to go up in your head that that, that is not the most inclusive or our, our best way to emphasize our common humanity, to, to think about um, language as a bridge and a connector rather than a barrier. Um, and the other word that falls onto the slide um, is the idea of vulnerable. Um, it's a word that people often use to describe other people and you rarely hear somebody describe themselves as vulnerable. And it, there's, there's something about that word that um, seems to put the, I'm gonna use the word blame, that might not be quite the right word, but it seems to put the responsibility for the problem on the person rather than the community. So I would encourage folks to, to think about that word and, and really be intentional about using that word. I also love that um, new um, wheelchair um, mobility handicap, handicap sign. Um, when you're talking about racial and ethnic identity, let's lead with ask, ask what people prefer. This is a really complex issue. There's a lot of emotions, there's a lot of history. Um, I am a white, straight, cisgender woman, and I have to be really aware of the fact that I cannot make assumptions. Um, and I get it wrong sometimes, and it's hard, and it feels weird, but um, I have a colleague who I, um, in writing, made a reference to Latinx, and this person is um, from a country that speaks Spanish, and she does not identify with the word Latinx. Um, as a result of her asking me why I used it, we had a really good conversation. I dug in a little bit more. I was unaware of the fact that Latinx is actually um, a word that was developed by English speakers and is in fact not pronounceable in Spanish. Um, so my bad for hearing a word thinking, oh, that sounds good. Um, so that's a really good example of ask what people want to be called. Um, I would also say it's really important to be specific. Um, people of color are not one big monolithic community. Um, if you're talking about Black Americans or Chinese Americans or members of the Seminole tribe in Florida, say that. Um, that is probably going to serve the audience better. It's really helpful to think about it that way. And then this last point on this slide, um, there is a lot of, there are a lot of government documents and forms and research that tend toward using the word minority or non-white. I would ask folks to think about the fact that those words actually, I'm sorry, that those words actually perpetuate this idea that white is the standard or the normal. Um, we live in a, a country where the population is shifting rapidly. Um, 
the majority of the population is not white in many communities, many states, and soon won't be for, you know, across the country. Um, so setting up this idea that white is the ideal or the norm and that um, people of color are somehow in this other status, those words evoke that. And even if your message is really good and important, there are folks in the audience who are not going to be able to hear it. Um, so I really encourage folks to be mindful of the history and the emotions that come with some of these, some of these language cues and, and why that's so important. And then um, elder speak. Um, and this is something that Lindsay and I also have talked about a little. Um, this is so well-intentioned and you can see this last bullet, um, which I bolded because I think it's really important for us to hear. Um, I had the opportunity to meet and talk to a lot of people who are direct service providers. And it is surprising to me how common this is. And I, you know, it comes along this idea of protectiveness or swooping in or um, taking, it, it really boils down to people taking agency away from somebody older, presuming that they know better than the older person. Um, so you hear it in the, our seniors wouldn't want that, or we love our seniors, we don't mean anything by that. You hear, let's, Diane, let's put on our blue sweater today. Um, there, there's all these ways that this elder speak comes out. Um, and it really does actually diminish your standing um, with the older person many times or the people around you. Um, and I, I think it's so, I, I know it's so well-intentioned, at least from the people that I know who I've had the opportunity to talk to about it. So I, I do like to call it out as something that, um, you know, we we should be very, very mindful of. Um, and. The, the second bullet, the our seniors, I would even broaden that um, to be mindful of assigning ownership to any people. Um, if you're using the word in front our in front of any group of people, I would encourage you to just think twice and make sure that you, you, you want it to be heard in the way that it, it might be heard. Um, okay, so this is, I'm back to frameworks. Um, this is something that um, comes up a lot um, because you may have noticed I've been using the word older people and older adults throughout the presentation. Um, and a lot of you may be accustomed to using the word senior citizen or seniors or elderly or elders. Um, and so frameworks knew that. And so they ran an experiment to understand how people, um, what what baggage, I guess, is I'm going to say, the way that people carried with these different words. Um, and here are the results. Oh, this slide's going to build really slowly. There we go. Okay. So um, actually, I'm going to give one disclaimer before I explain the slide, because I think it's critically important. Um, while the, thir the, the people that frameworks talk to were, um, uh, were um, representative of the United States in terms of ages and ethnic backgrounds um, and gender and rural and urban and all of, all of those things. I, when I saw this initially, what jumped out at me was the word elder and um, that word should be elderly. Um, the word elder is a term of reverence and in many communities of color, in indigenous cultures, um, in, in many, many communities, elder is a very, um, it's, a, it's an honorific. It's, it's not a word that folks have a poor association with. Um, but this slide says elder. And when I questioned frameworks on it, um, they said it should be elderly. And I don't have the new slide yet. Um, so that's important to know. So up at the top here, um, you can see that when asked, folks ranked elderly, senior citizen, senior, older person, and older adults. And people believed when they heard older adult, that was a person who was more competent 
than an elderly person. So, you know, it's across the scale here. And then the second question down at the bottom, they asked people to assign an age when they, what, what age did they associate with, with these various words? And so you can see, you know, 68, 69 on the left side, older person 64, older adult, interestingly, is younger than everybody else on here. Um, so Frameworks says, if you want to get people to cue over 60 and competent, older person is ideal. Older adult is fine. Um, and a lot more people have been using it. But that is the reason for the recommendation, this idea of competence and that these words, elderly and senior citizen and senior have, for lack of a better way to describe it, you know, kind of become part of the punchline. Like it's the, you know, all the senior citizens lining up for the blue plate special, or, you know, I don't want to go on the cruise ship. There, it, It's just all of those associations that have been permeating our media and and our communities have left people um, with a poor association with those words. So we have really been advocating very strongly to have folks use older people or older adult. Um, actually, several style guides, including the Associated Press and AMA and the New England Journal have all um, begun to adopt the standard of using older people or older adults. Um, I will also say that just like on the previous slide, being specific is better. So if you're talking about people who are over 65, say that. If you're talking about somebody who is 68, instead of saying, you know, Katrina did X, Y, Katrina, comma, a senior citizen did X, Y, Z. Katrina, who is 68, did X, Y, Z. Um, you know, if, if the age is important, then include the age, don't include the label, is I guess the better way to put that. So, oh, here we go. So we have a bit of a quick start guide here that Frameworks put together. Um, and you can see on the left are examples of um, the kinds of words that stimulate these um, negative models that we talked about earlier. Um, I have always been fascinated at the idea that people associate a tsunami or a tidal wave I, I mean, I get it. I get alliteration. I get that people think that this is sort of a fun metaphor. But um, having a, having our demographics change is not going to result in what a tsunami does. It's not going to wipe our population and all of our homes and all of our infrastructure off the ground. Um, it just means we have to shift. And it just means we have to think differently. Um, if, if you look at the second box on the left here, this idea of choice and planning and control, that really plays into the idea that people have that individuals are responsible somehow for their own health. And it really allows people to skate away. It allows folks to not acknowledge that we have to provide supports in communities, that we have to look at communities that have historically been under-resourced. It allows people to um, really kind of point fingers, um, which does not help us get to collective solutions. We've talked about seniors, elderly, and othering terms. And, and the hardest thing for me is the bottom right corner. Um, I've gotten better, and I'm sure I've made mistakes today because I still struggle with it, um, using we and us instead of them and they. Um, we are all aging. From the moment we're born, we are aging, regardless of our age. So um, to the extent that you can adopt this idea of we are doing this, this is something you know um, we found for ourselves and any way that we can um, emphasize the idea that we're aging together um, is, is really going to bring folks into seeing aging as something that we're all invested in and not just something for other people. Um, you know, this is, if any of you have ever worked um, in, in an organization that's been like the American Cancer Society or the American Heart Association or the Alzheimer's Association, this is very similar. You know, it's not about battles and fights and conflicts. Um, talk, we talked early on about what the definition of ageism was and making sure that folks understand when you're talking about it, what it means. And um, we haven't really talked about this um, directly, but this idea that 
offering concrete examples, offering specific recommendations helps address this idea of fatalism that people get overwhelmed and when they hear or see that somebody else has taken a, tried a solution or done something new, um, it, it opens up their mind to the possibility that it's not so overwhelming. So it's really important um, to look at, look at ways to um, give, give folks that hope. I'm going to pause. Um, there's a couple of other slides in the deck, but they're mostly examples. Um, so I'm going to pause. Um, we're approaching 2.30, and I promised that I would give ample time for questions. Um, so I want to do that now. Um, folks can chat in. I think we're a small enough group. Um, what I will actually do is I will stop sharing. And if folks would prefer to unmute, that is fine by me, um, if that's okay with Lindsay. And I'm happy to answer any questions. And then I'll just take a quick look at the slides and see if there's anything that I want to make sure to share um, before we wrap up. Well, I just wanted to say real quick, uh, thank you, Allery, for your presentation. Um, and I have a question just to get us started. Um, so do you do we have any indication that the reframing aging work um, is making a difference? Thank you. Um, so the the frameworks folks will tell us that social change, you know, is more generational work. It takes time. I'm sure that many of you are doing similar work and can appreciate that. But we have seen some really nice examples. Um, as I said, I'm here in New England and we've worked with um, some folks in New Hampshire, um, which is a state whose motto is live free or die. Um, it's not a state that um, has as much of um, an emphasis on, you know, sort of community centers and things as, as some other states do. And they uh, stood up a commission on aging a couple of years ago. Um, and they worked really closely with the framework's um, guidelines and developing uh, materials to uh, work with legislators and elected officials to, um, to really help approach the conversation in a way that would be productive. Um, and I think they did a great job, um, not something that I'm taking credit for. I really want to make sure it's clear I'm giving them credit. But I think that when you see a state like New Hampshire, um, that has a different ethos that is, is going to make a commitment to the changing demographics. I think that is an example of having an effective communications approach. And then I also really take heart in seeing so many organizations like the American Heart Association, like Google. Google has an inclusive marketing toolkit online that has all kinds of guidance about inclusive language and they pull out aging and have adopted many of the reframing aging guidelines so when you start to see this momentum building with these leading companies and organizations saying, I want to talk differently about older people, to me, that's a recognition that folks understand that they don't want to perpetuate the problem. And so I think that's a first step. And um, so those are a couple of examples. Thanks, Allery. It looks like uh, Stephanie has a question. Terrific. Yes, hi, thank you for the amazing presentation. Um, I have a two-part question. The, um, I'm the uh, leader of a national organization, Respecting Choices, and um, I see this information is so valuable in two ways. One, you said that you'd share the recording in the presentation, so I'm wondering if I can use this recording and this presentation to educate our internal team. Um, and then also then what would be your recommendation? We have a lot of um, uh, relationships with others, um, other national organizations, um, primarily healthcare organizations. What would be your recommendation uh, for us to help spread this word? Oh, my favorite kind of question. Thank you, Stephanie. <laughs> um, let's talk a little bit more out offline um i'd love to learn more about the organization and i'd love to see if i can connect you um if it's something i can't do maybe i can connect you to some other folks who could do a training for your group um the recommendation from frameworks is whenever possible to um to try to have more of a live presentation and i will tell you because of the unique nature of this group because it was folks who have a very specific message for at a very specific venue. Um, 
I made some tweaks. So there are some things that are missing that I, if it were for your group, if I were doing it for your group, I would want to make sure to build those elements back in to make sure that um, they got that piece of okay. it. Okay. So, um, and to I, best I, use I, your I, time, um, to best use your time, we're part of the John A. Hartford Foundation and the Cambia Foundation's um, uh, Message Lab grant. Uh, that Tony Bach is PI. Yep. And, um, and I actually think that our entire group would be very interested um, in this information. And so um, that would that would leverage your time and expertise um, much more substantially. That's awesome. That's awesome. Thank you for that opportunity. Um, I will um, make sure to get your email from Stephanie, or I'm sorry, from Alice or Lindsay, and okay. I'll send you mine, and we'll figure out a time to connect. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Lindsay, is your hand up? It is. Um, Allery, thank you so much for this. It, it's so helpful. And I, I've heard you present this a few times now, and I learn something new every time. One of the questions that I often get asked um, by our members uh, is around the naming of organizations, right? And so what do we do if the word senior is, you know, part of our official organization's name. It's on our 501c3. Like, what do we do about that? Is that a problem? Um, do we all need to rename ourselves? It's a question that I've sort of struggled with and, and multiple people have posed to me around reframing aging. E it may have been the first question out of, um, uh, I, I trained with a cohort of about a, I guess it was 15 or 16 people. Um, and it may have been the first question out of the mouths of our cohort. I mean, it, it's right, it's right there. Um, so back then, um, what Framework said was, we understand that, excuse me, we understand that there's reasons there are names, right? In, in some communities, it might be the Lindsay Goldman Senior Center, and it's an endowment from your family, and that name is never going to change. Um, and in other communities, there may not be a history or tradition connected to the name. Um, but if you can't change the name, let's start there. Let's just say, for whatever reason, you can't change the name. You can certainly look at everything you do in your communications to make sure that your messages are inviting people in and are welcoming and inclusive and respectful. The name is the name, it's on the sign, but you can certainly look at everything else. Um, so, you know, I think that that's fair. What I, will, what I will say is in the intervening years, we have seen um, in, in, in our area, some really clever, impressive, tremendous renamings. Um, in the slides, you saw some photos with some older people that said, how do I age strong? So in Boston, um, there used to be something called the Commission on Affairs of the Elderly. And there was some um, humor when the Commissioner Emily Shea introduced herself because seriously, right? I'm, I'm here to talk about the affairs of the elderly. I mean, so many problems with that. Um, and they went through a rebranding and they are now the Age Strong Commission. And to introduce their name, they did this whole campaign with bus shelters, with real Bostonians. Um, and that, that's where those photos came from. You know, I'm not cranky, I'm not, uh, or I'm stylish, you know, different things to show how they were age strong. Um, we now have an organization that used to be, um, I'm blanking, of the Merrimack Valley. I'm blanking of what the first, elder services of Mary McDally. Um, it is now age span um, because they want to reflect that they are serving a broader population. Um, we've had several senior centers that have rebranded. Um, the one in Lawrence, Massachusetts, um, it goes by El Centro because it's serving a primarily Spanish speaking population. We've got some other centers um, that have dropped senior, Barnstable, Worcester, it's, it's hard, it's hard. and, it, and especially um, if it, the community has really strong feelings about it, um, but it can be done. And you know, there's some nice opportunities to think about what that would mean, what message that would send, but I would always default to looking at 
what you're saying about yourself and how you're reaching out to people in other ways if don't let that word stop you from doing everything else. Thanks, that's helpful. Any other questions? Oh, thank you, Alice. You just saved us an email. Stephanie, Alice put my um, email address in the chat, so you have it. <laughs> thank you. That's awesome. All right, I'm just going to turn my head for a second and flip over here and see. Oh, yes, I do want to make sure. Um, let me go back. Oh, sorry. Let's try this again. I cannot share. I cannot figure out how to share my slides if I'm in slide presenter mode um, or how to share my screen. So I'm going to try this this way. Did I successfully share my screen? Can you all see my slides? Did that work? Okay, excellent. So um, I just wanted to call folks' attention to um, the, this resource slide. I mentioned some of these resources, the implicit association tests, really, really encourage you to do that. Um, if you're at all a word geek, um, the Stanford Social Innovation Review has run a series that was co-authored with um, the folks at Frameworks and it's a lot of issues, the um, opioids, housing, transportation, um, environmentalism, climate change, uh, gun violence, all kinds of things. Uh, I found it incredibly helpful to read about other issues um, to help me see more clearly some of the trends that came up in the aging work. Um, I mentioned Google had this new all-inclusive mm -hmm. toolkit. Um, an anti-ageism guide to action from each friendly communities. And then I also mentioned the American Heart Association. Um, I think this is an incredibly helpful, well, very thoughtful um, guide if you're looking for better ways um, to talk about structural racism and health equity. Um, and there's some nice context. So I really appreciated that. So I wanted to just make sure that I called out for you all that these, um, these were here and um, Thank you for your time. I, you know, this was a significant investment of time and I really appreciate folks being engaged and um, being willing to think differently. And I hope this is helpful. I look forward to, I'll, I'll be there in Scottsdale. I look forward to seeing folks and hearing and learning from all of you. That is my favorite thing about this conference. Um, I always walk away with more notes than my brain can absorb. So I am, I'm really looking forward to learning. So thank you very much. Lindsay, is there anything you wanna say before we wrap? No, just thank you so much, Allery, for your generosity and sharing your time and your wisdom around this topic, which is so important. And I am so excited to see all of you in Scottsdale next month. Thanks, Thanks so everyone. much, everyone. Have a great day. Bye. Bye.